Hi, my name is Omar. Welcome to today's webinar about analysing temperature data. This data could be collected in a Matec ECU or DASH and it can be opened in our data analysis software called i2. Now I assume some basic knowledge of how to use the i2 software. If you're unfamiliar with this software then I'd recommend reading our i2 training notes or watching the appropriate webinar so you can be familiar with the functions of the software. Both of these can be downloaded from our website. Today, these are some of the topics I'll be talking about. I would like to start with what we can learn from our temperature data, what we can measure, how fast we should log these channels, and then go through an actual real-world example. Temperatures are some of the most vital channels to look at in terms of reliability and should be the first channels of data to look at before analysing a driver's performance. Sometimes the data can explain why there are deficiencies in the performance of the vehicle and driver. One reason to look at data between sessions is to see if there's a problem developing. For example, a leak in our cooling system might not cause problems during a session, but it could lead to engine damage in the next session if it isn't fixed. So looking at the trends in the data from the previous session, it may give us an opportunity to find and fix a problem before any damage occurs. As an engine builder, you would like to see that your engine is running at the correct temperatures because too low or too high engine temperatures can cause damage to the engine. This is because the oil may not be performing at its best because lubrication properties might be less than ideal at these temperatures, so the reliability and performance of your engine may be affected. Another benefit of looking at this data is to evaluate your cooling hardware. For example, if we change the brake cooling duct design, we can find some gain not in better braking performance in terms of shorter braking distances, but possibly in reducing brake pad wear, as the wear rate usually increases dramatically if we're seeing brake temperatures higher than the manufacturer's recommended operating temperature range. You can therefore see the data, black and white, comparisons between components. Our ECUs are capable of adjusting the fuel and ignition maps to cater for temperature changes that you might actually see on track. Quality of air entering the engine changes based on many factors including air inlet and engine temperature. Some of these channels you might not be able to simulate properly on the dyno. So logging this data can be really helpful for the engine tuner so that between sessions these ECU maps could be modified to take into account the environmental conditions and offer some gains in performance. Here are some photos of various sensors that you could connect to your MoTeC ECU or DASH. On the left hand side there, you can see a list of temperatures you could measure in your vehicle, such as engine oil, coolant, fuel, gearbox and diff oil. The type of sensor to use for measuring these is an oil and water sensor shown here on the left. It's relatively inexpensive and can be fitted to the hardware you're trying to measure. It can read temperatures up to about 140 degrees Celsius. On the right hand side here, we have the more expensive infrared sensor that we usually use to measure brake and tyre temperatures with. These sensors are quite useful to engineers who are tuning the car chassis setup. By reading the temperatures across the surface of the uh, tyre, uh, for example, the temperature distribution across the surface can be measured. Now, these can also be used for measuring brake temperatures, but we have to keep in mind that these sensors can only take 100 degrees physically. So this is very tricky when measuring brakes that are around 900 degrees. So normally we mount them in a stream of airflow, such as the brake cooling duct, to keep the temperatures of the actual sensors down. In the centre here, we have an air temp sensor. This is commonly mounted in the intake manifold, but you could install them before and after an intercooler if you wanted to see if it's efficient at cooling the inlet temperatures. You could also, for example, mount them in a vehicle cabin to measure the driver comfort. If a driver is too hot, he may, it may cause some fatigue and their lap times might be slower, particularly late in the endurance race. Looking at the data, you might be able to establish this relationship. You can quickly see how versatile these sensors can be. In the bottom right, we have an exhaust gas K-type thermocouple, or an exhaust gas probe. This is for measuring high temperatures found in an engine's exhaust headers. These are particularly useful to ensure you're not seeing temperatures that could cause damage to exhaust valves or turbos. Now, a lot of people ask me, how fast should I log temperature data? Well, the update rate of a sensor is the time it takes the sensor to convert a temperature change into a voltage, and this is about a second. So logging the data any faster than twice a second in our ECU or dash logger will not give us any more information. So to save logging memory, we log these at twice a second only. If you know the update rate of your sensor, the general rule of thumb is that we log the data at twice the update rate to make sure we capture all the data. Here you can see I've opened some data on my laptop in i2. 
I've pressed the F2 key to zoom out so I can see the entire race. We can use this feature to make it easier for us to see any trends in the temperatures. It's important to consider why you are looking at the temperature data. Are you looking for a peak temperature to decide if a thermofan is required for times on the grid? Or to cool the car down at the end of the race? Perhaps you are looking at just racing labs so that you can see if there is sufficient cooling during a race situation. The answer to this determines where and how you should be looking at the data. In this example we can focus on a purple trace which is the gearbox oil temperature. You can see reading off the scale on the left that it starts at around 15 degrees and increases every lap throughout the session and it looks like it's reached a maximum of 85 degrees. Now what if the race was longer and the temperature kept on increasing like this? We might have to consider perhaps using an oil killer to st stabilize the temperatures around the ideal operating temperatures. Here you can see the use of a built-in function in I2. This is, allows us to view the minimums, maximums and average values for the on-screen data. I did this by pressing M for mic and you can see these measurements for the whole run. The small blue box there with the arrow pointing down are the minimums, the red box with the arrow pointing up is the maximum and the orange box with the white circle is the average. As you adjust the zoom level of the data these measurements are linked and will change based on the visible data. This feature quickly shows us the important temperature information very quickly and helps highlight any abnormally high temperatures. So the next thing to do is to zoom into the area before lap 4 where the peak can be seen in engine temperature to, so we can investigate further. Here are focused around the maximum engine temperature to understand why there is so much higher than the 80 degrees or so I would expect to see for this motor. You can also see the red oil temperature trace here actually peaking after the end of the race. The orange trace of the inlet air temp is fairly steady. If we were looking at a turbocharged setup with an intercooler and our inlet air temp was fairly high, um, this could have an impact on the amount of horsepower we were making because as we know that for the same volume of air, uh, higher temperature air has less oxygen and therefore less bang for buck than a volume of air which is cooler and this is because of the different air densities. I've also set up a channel report down here in the bottom left hand corner and this is to show me the maximums for each lap which is another useful way of looking at temperature data over a session very quickly. We just need to be cautious using only a channel report as this might not give us the full picture. As you can see it's reported to me the maximum engine temperature of 103.5 degrees on lap 1. So basically it's telling us when it occurred during the race but not actually why. To help diagnose the problem, I've actually displayed ground speed data above here. Now, logging this with the other channels, I'm able to see that at minus 250 seconds before the actual selected lap, we can see that the engine temperature was around 80, but as the ground speed was zero, we saw the maximum engine temperature occur. But as the race continued, you can actually see that the temperatures fell down to a stable 80 degrees. So we might consider installing a thermofan in this vehicle if we expect to stay on the grid for longer. But because the temperature stabilized during the race, you can really see that this data is showing us that it's not the uh, cooling ability of the car that's a problem, but more of a case of that it was stationary for so long. So today that was a short webinar on analyzing temperature data. And hopefully now you have an understanding of how to collect and analyze temperature data. We've gone through the importance of temperature data for reliability, what sensors to use for measuring different temperatures. Also we've discussed update rates of temperature sensors and logging the data at twice a second. And finally we've gone through an example to demonstrate how we analyze the data. Thanks for watching and please visit our website so you can ask any of your questions. There's a link to the forum here on the left. And if you have uh, any other MoTeC webinars that you'd like to see, please have a look at the links on the right.